ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ephraim Brammer. Chimigwich, Klasukomati, muchísimas gracias. Thank you. I especially want to thank Satori for doing such a wonderful job. Cheryl, my fellow storytellers tonight and all of you. I have a terrible memory actually, which is a huge liability for somebody who sometimes likes to think of themselves as a writer. Right? <laughs> I don't have memories. I have sounds, I have colors, I have smells, I have sensations. I have this ranchera songs that my mother used to dance to in the kitchen as she flipped over the tortillas. I don't have a good memory. Right? I don't remember my father as a child. I feel him. I hear his voice. I feel his presence. It's blood memory. I grew up in a small town in Southern California, El Centro de la Palma de la Mano de Dios, California. <laughs> El Centro de la Palma de la Mano de Dios in English is literally the center of the palm of God's hand, which would be a beautiful place to grow up, right? Yes. Except for I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Right? As a child, my father, he was working class. He worked for the city. He fixed streets and roads, right? He fixed street lights, and, and uh, he was a city worker, and he worked hard. Actually, he worked hard his entire life because at the age 13, he lost his own father to a trucking accident, and he was the oldest and only son. He had been supporting a family since he was 13 years old. So we grew up on the north side, on the wrong side of the tracks. And I don't have memories, but I do have photos. They're these yellowing, discolored, frayed photos, and in almost every single one, it's the same pose. My father comes home in his work clothes. I run to him, poppy, poppy, poppy. I give him a big hug. We turn around and my mom's there with the camera. Snap. <laughs> Always the same pose. There's one in particular. My father comes home. He's covered, caked in this gray muck, mud, dried all over his clothes. And I run up to him, poppy, poppy, poppy. And I give him a hug and I'm covered in the same gray muck and gunk. It wasn't for many, many years later that my mother finally had the uh, heart to tell me my father had been working in the sewers all day. <laughs> he was covered from head to toe in shit. <laughs> and so was I. And I was smiling from ear to ear. Right? Every single photo, even the sewer photo, my father's embracing me from behind. Right? He's caressing my face, and I'm loving every single second of it. And so, we grew up on the north side, in El Centro de la Palma de Dios. And some interesting things happened. My father, I think it's important you know, to, to recognize the Anishinaabe people. Right? Those are the native people, the three fires nations that lived and continue to live in this land, right, for thousands of years. And Anishinaabe have seven sacred grandfather teachings, right? Um, and my father's not native, but he definitely taught me one special uh, of the seven sacred grandfather teachings, which is wisdom. And the Three Fire Nations, they say that wisdom, they define wisdom as the gaining of knowledge through hard work and dedication. And there's nothing that better defines my father. And so this sort of miraculous thing that happened was just a product of my father's hard work. Right? So my father didn't have a college degree when I was a child. I was probably five or six years be uh, old before he actually got his college degree. But he worked hard, and he was dedicated to that dream, and he finished it on a GI Bill. right? But I remember sitting in the parking lot, right? We'd pile into our station wagon, go uh, to San Diego State, and we'd go to the parking lot. And back then, you didn't need 
seat belts, right? So me and my brothers, we'd be running around in the back of the station wagon doing all of our best, you know, uh, Jimmy Snooperfly and Andre the Giant wrestling moves, right? Uh, El Santo, Mil Mascaras, we're beating on each other, right? As my father was taking classes. And finally, my mom, of course, she'd take off her shoe, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> put us all straight and we'd sit in the back of that station wagon and we'd study. I can't tell you how many books I read under that light, right? Late at night, doing my math homework, my brothers too, waiting for my dad to get out of class. Right? And he finally graduated. After he graduated, it, he still needed to get his engineering license because he wanted to be a civil engineer. He wanted to go from working you know, it, out in the streets to actually designing those streets and, and designing, uh, you know, all those lights and everything else. And so I remember when he actually went and did his license exam. It was the same parking lot, San Diego State, early one Saturday morning. And there were people literally with like libraries on wheels, just full of books, right? Carrying them to the class where they're going to take their exams. Guys that had books arm to arm walking. And my father had a pencil and a paper pad for scratch paper. And we were scared, right? Like, what's wrong with my father here? Well, you're going to fail this exam, right? This is your live stream, and you're going to fail. You're not as prepared as them. And I remember my father pulling me to the side, and he said, Mijo, if I'm not ready now, I'm never going to be ready. Hard work dedication, wisdom. And my father passed the exam. Right? And our lives changed like that. We moved from the bad side of the tracks to the good side of the tracks. We went from the north side right, to the west side. We got a big house. We got a new car. We went to new schools. We went from the wrong side of the tracks to the right side of the tracks, also sometimes known as the white side of the tracks. And so I experienced a bigger house, bigger cars, but also some things that I hadn't experienced before, right? There's a lot of words that we don't use in our families, things that go unsaid, right? My father was a man of few words and rarely said, I love you. Right? Rarely said, I'm proud of you. Rarely talked about me being adopted. Right? And we rarely talked about racism, discrimination, exclusion. Right? But when I was at school and it was time to play Cowboys and Indians, guess who was the only Indian? <laughs> And so it was inescapable. And so even though we didn't talk about it, there's some inescapable things in our family as well. So my father, not only did he commit the cardinal sin of marrying a Mexican, he married a Mexican with three very Mexican boys. And it was something that his own mother couldn't accept. And so, I think I've only seen my father's mother before she passed maybe three times, two or three times in my life. Even though my father was so dedicated to his family, he went to Iowa. She left California, moved to Iowa as a result of that marriage, right? He went to Iowa at least once a year, or as often as he could, because he still loved his family, even though they couldn't accept us. And so it's ironic that my white adopted father was the one who taught me probably the most about diversity, inclusion, right? Embracing others, loving others and other cultures, right? Even when it comes at personal cost, mm -hmm. right? The dedication to social justice, even when you have to sacrifice, even when you're punished for it, right? In very personal ways. And so, my father, as much as we were adopted, my father was an adopted Mexican, right? <laughs> and so some of my favorite photos uh, were actually of his honeymoon with my mother, 
right? So these very romantic gondola rides down the canals of Xochimilco, right? Listening to mariachi in Garibaldi Square, right? Going to the pyramids of Teotihuacan. My father loved Mexican food. Even though when he uh, ate really hot chiles, and he loved to eat really hot chiles, he would burn as red as a uh, stoplight, right? My father, when he became an engineer, worked for City Hall. The uniform was suit and a tie, but not for my dad. My dad wore a guayabera, like this, right? This is the Mexican tuxedo. <laughs> Right? And this is my father's uniform to go to work every day. Right? He had every color in the rainbow. Baby blue, canary yellow, bright pink. Right? And the contrast against his white skin was elegant. It was beautiful. Right? It was so beautiful I want to be just like him. So then the first time I had a school dance, I was in junior high. I had my junior high girlfriend. We were going to get all dressed up. We were going to go to the school dance. And of course, I wanted to look like my papi. So I put on my baby blue guayabera, just like my papi. I had my girl under my arm. I was walking to the school gym. This was going to be great. Doors open in that gym on that west side school. All the other kids dressed in tuxedos, right? I was laughed out of that gym. And the girl that was under my arm took one step back, <laughs> took another step back, <laughs> and she was gone. I never wore a guayabera again, right? Until I was probably my late 20s or 30s. It hurt so bad. But my father, you know, I went home crying and, you know, devasta devastated. My father took me to the side. He said, mijo, never be ashamed of who you are. Never be ashamed of your culture, right? And it was that kind of wisdom, right? That dedication to me, that hard working with me, right, that inspired me. And everything that my dad did inspired me. It was to the point where even in sports, all my dad had to do was show up. By the time I was in high school, there was five of us, right? And so my dad didn't have a lot of time. He was working and everything like that. He didn't have a lot of time to go all of our sports events and everything like that. He had to spread himself, and my mom they had to spread themselves pretty thin across the five of us, right? So every time he went to one of my sporting events, it was special. And I remember one particular time, all those moves that I learned in the back of the station wagon, right? Boom. Naturally, I was a wrestler in high school, right? <laughs> okay? And so I had a wrestling match in San Diego. But my first match was going to be really, really early, right? My dad said he was going to be there, but I didn't know because of a long trip to San Diego. And so I remember warming up, you know, looking out the gym door, seeing if he was going to be there. Right? Nope, haven't shown up. I remember the referee saying, hey, kid, right? You're on. You have to come to the mat now, right? Or you're going to forfeit. So I, I kind of go out, right? I start taking my pose, but I'm still looking at the door. I'm still looking at the door, right? The referee has the whistle to his mouth. And right then, right before he blew the whistle, the gym door is open. I see my poppy across the mat, and that boy didn't have a chance. <laughs> Ten second pin. <laughs> Fastest uh, pin in my whole high school career. Okay. My father, my adoptive father, we hardly ever use that word, right? I think sometimes even loved me more than my own mother, my biological mother. Right? My father's an engineer. I have an older brother who's an engineer. And naturally, I was supposed to be an engineer. And I was headed down that path for at least a couple years. So I ended up in a, a college counselor's office, and she was saying, you know, you're never going to graduate here <laughs> if you don't take your English class. I was dodging, right, the whole English class. And so life is full of ironies. She put me in a class with none other than Quincy Troop. I had to take an intro to poetry 
with one of the great poets, right, uh, of our time. Quincy became like a father figure to me in college and inspired me to change my major. <laughs> I loved Quincy. My parents didn't like Quincy so much. <laughs> Going from engineering to creative writing, my parents pulled me to the side and said, we are not paying for you to become a starving poet. <laughs> They cut me off. I was like, are you kidding? Like, yes. If you're going to study poetry, you're going to pay for it yourself. Ironically, right, all that I learned from my father, his wisdom, hard work, dedication right, to things that you love, even if it comes at great personal cost, was a thing that said, yes, I'm going to major in creative writing. I did couch surfing for at least a year. Right? I lived off the of top ramen. And my parents, they said, we're cut off, don't even come and talk to us. Right? And when I didn't have money for rent, and I didn't even have money for bus fare or top ramen, it was my dad that was calling me behind my mom's back. <laughs> I still don't think she knows. Right? Maybe when she watches this video. <laughs> my dad would call me. Mijo, how are you doing? Are you all right? Are you making it? Do you need something to get by? Right? My mother worked in the fields, had an eighth grade education, and when I graduated with my Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing um, from San Francisco State, my mother didn't even go to the graduation. She still hadn't forgiven me. But my father went. Right? He was the only one that celebrated my master's degree with me. I think it wasn't until I finished my PhD, published two books, and <laughs> proved to my mother <laughs> that I wasn't going to be a starving poet living in her basement, right, that she finally forgave me. Right? Like I said, life is full of ironies. And so my wife and I had an opportunity um, when we were just married to also adopt, adopt a family member, right, a very white family member, <laughs> red hair, blue eyes, right, ironically, who looked a lot like my father when he was young. <laughs> and so naturally, my wife looks a lot like me, so naturally we get a lot of looks, right? We even get crazy people. I remember one time we were in Oakland Mall, right, and there was this man, literally, he followed me and chased me across all of Oakland Mall, right, the whole length of Oakland Mall. Your wife cheated on you. There ain't no way that's your boy. <laughs> you need to leave that woman. Right? My wife and I, we live in constant fear of the police, <laughs> of the border patrol, right? Of them taking our kid away from us. You think driving while black or brown is bad? Put a small white child in the back of your car. <laughs> Most people aren't so obvious, right? A lot of us will look at us and say, a lot of them will look at us and say, hmm, red hair. <laughs> Where did those blue eyes come from? <laughs> and every time we get those looks, and every time we get those questions, all I do is bring my son close, hug him from behind, caress his cheeks, and proudly say, he looks just like my father. Thank you so much, guys. Dr. Ethram Brammer, everybody. And this is son right there. <laughs> and his wife and his daughter, yay.